Hello, hello, and welcome to Wine Access Unfiltered. I am your host, Amanda McCrossin, here with my favorite co-host, Vanessa Conlin. Oh, shucks, thanks. Great to be here, Amanda. It's good to have you back, and I have to say, this is probably an episode I'm really excited for, but maybe an episode that you're like slightly excited slash nervous for. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's it's a very it's very interesting topic. There's a lot of questions around it, so I'm excited to answer those questions for people today. Yeah. And there are a lot of questions, I think rightfully so because even when I moved to Napa Valley, this was I didn't even know this existed. I did not know that NDA wines, which we're going to define and deconstruct and talk about in just a few moments, I didn't know that this whole world existed. And what's been fascinating is not only does it exist, but it's one of the best ways to get incredible wines at unbelievable prices. I mean, I remember the first time you guys shipped me, I think it was the editorial, like maybe two or three years ago. And Mm -hmm. I pulled the cork and I was like, all right, we'll see how this goes. And I read the write up and I was like, this sounds interesting. And I pulled the cork and I poured the glass and I was like, holy guacamole this is unbelievable juice. And I just was like lit up about it. And then as they continued to become available, um, I <laughs> will talk about this too. I started talking about it more on Instagram and then on TikTok. And now it's sort of become a, their, their cult wines themselves, you know? And, and I think that's been a really interesting thing to see over the last few years that they really have developed this intense following. So I'm excited to talk about it. I know there's a lot that you can't say, but (laughs) we're also going to dive into the nitty gritty of what you can say, because I think there's a a lot Mm -hmm. of misconceptions and misnomers about this category of wine that I'm excited to dive a little deeper into beyond the three minutes that I normally get on TikTok. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on in the world of wine. I... I think one of the most interesting things that our producer Chappie found for us was this article from the San Francisco Chronicle. And you and I both live in Napa Valley. I'm not sure how we are just discovering this in the Chronicle, but our friends over at Perlis, uh, Anthony Perlis and Aaron Pott, who makes the wine, have added a very interesting ingredient to their wine in the way of San Francisco Bay water. Yes. Yum. (laughs) (laughs) That was a surprising article to read. I, I have to say, I have not tasted said wine with seawater in it, but I, I would be fascinated to try it. Would you want to try it? hundred percent. I think this is super yeah. interesting. And I think when you read the article, it, you know, it, it talks about the fact that this is sort of an ancient tradition that's been done, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, this idea of adding, you know, a little bit of water to the wine I, I'm not sure what it does. I am curious, but I think what it does is, for me, it, it calls into question or further into question this idea of wines that aren't necessarily just made from grapes. And this has been sort of a growing trend. In fact, the other night I had, you know, really, really interesting co-ferment of apple and grape sparkling wine from Scar of the Seed down in, in uh, Central mm-hmm. Coast Santa Barbara area. And it was delicious. But you're seeing this kind of all over the United States. You're seeing it with Hayu Farms. They do a couple co ferments. You're seeing fruit wines. You and I did a panel not too long ago where, you know, Yannick uh, Benjamin from, from New York City was talking about uh, the fact that he was really excited about local wines and fruit wines. And I think this is a really interesting topic that I want to continue to explore over the next few months slash years of wines that are not necessarily exclusively made from grapes. But I am curious on on your thoughts, being a master of wine, do you think that a wine has to only be made from grapes exclusively to be called wine? You said fruit wine. So I think that's a good distinction to make because obviously grapes are fruits. When we talk about fruit wine, we're talking about uh, fermented other fruits like apples, peaches, things like that. So yeah, anything with sugar can ferment. To answer your question, I don't think that wine has to come only from grapes. I remember when I was um, a buyer at a shop in New York City, I used to sell a honey wine that was really fascinating and great with like spicy food. Um, So I'll say I there has never been uh, wines made from anything other than grapes on the Master of Wine exam, and to my knowledge, not on any other. (laughs) Thank goodness (laughs) you passed before that became a thing. 
<laughs> exactly. I got in just under the wire, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I doubt that will ever change uh, in terms of those examinations. But absolutely, I, th- I think that wine can be made and enjoyable from, from plenty of other things other than grapes. I think so too. And I think, you know, the other thing that I, I've seen is the addition of like certain herbs. I know some, some producers are adding um, kefir lime leaves uh, as sort of mm-hmm. an aromatic component. I would be super curious to try this this pearless wine with a little bit of bay water. They did say it was clear, just so we're all, you know, we're not worrying about murky kind of gross water. It was it was clear. No, uh, and, no fish swimming around in there. Or no, but I will say, being that it is from San Francisco, I think fish are the least of my concerns. To be completely honest. <laughs> Very good point, Amanda. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> everything gets kind of like cooked out right with wine like it's all just mm-hmm. sort of inherently anti my, my, micro what? I can't say that whatever you know what I'm trying Microbial. to say yes. thank you I, I do think that it's an interesting topic I'd be curious to try the wine allegedly they're not seeing like a huge difference between you know still tastes like Napa Cab uh so I, I don't know I think you know Aaron if you're listening Anthony if you're listening yeah we'd love to try it <laughs> I, I would be interested to know what happened after that article came out if, if they got a you know a bunch of inquiries of people wanting to to buy it and try oh, I'm it. Sure. Or, I'm right? sure. Yeah. And sort mm-hmm. of on that note, I don't just as a side note that I thought was really cool. I don't know if you saw our friends at Ligier Meredith have retired or about to retire yeah. and they yes. gifted their vineyard to Aaron Pot, which was really cool, something you don't see. So another cultural event that we we maybe weren't going to cover, but I, I just feel like it's worth noting that you know we're going to be talking about a very big sale in just a few seconds. Mm-hmm. But this was a really cool situation where the Ligier Meredith Vineyard on Mount Veter was gifted to their friend Aaron Pott, who has been a great friend and steward of the land for many, many years. And I've always loved that Syrah. Um, me too. So much. And it made me wish that I was better friends with them so that they would have gifted <laughs> it to me. <laughs> I'm like, who of who of my friends do I need to cultu- cultivate a better relationship with? Yeah. <laughs> Vanessa, if you have a vineyard that you'd like to gift, just know that I'll I'm I'm happy to take it off your hands for you at any time. Top top of my list, I promise. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, on the note of selling vineyards slash gifting vineyards, a vineyard was not gifted to our friends at Moet Hennessy. They did buy it, and this has been a very long several years process from, you know, the, the rumors that had been floating around for a while now, uh, Joseph Phelps has sold the legacy heralded winery right here in Napa Valley founded in the seventies, uh, used to produce some of my favorite wines, the Joseph Phelps Isley vineyard that is now they've been separated for, for a long time now, but, um, our friends at Moet Hennessy, who own, mm-hmm. you know, a, some some little champagne houses like Dom Perignon and Krug and Reno. I'm sure none of these you've ever heard of, right? No, I've never, I've no. never had them. Never had them. Um, so yeah, they've they've swept in and they bought Joseph Phelps for an undisclosed price. Although I think we can probably assume it was a fairly decent one, but mm-hmm. they swept in. And I think what's interesting is this is only their third property in Napa Valley that they've bought slash invested in. The first, obviously they own Shandong, which I don't think technically qualifies as like a purchase property because they founded that. But then they bought Newton, right. which is on Spring Mountain, unfortunately suffered tremendously in the fires. They they have a 60% stake in Colgan, which is on Pritchard Hill. And now this is their third and their third, not only in California, but in the United States, they don't have a ton of representation here. I didn't know that this was in the works until I read about it, but I have to say I I wasn't totally surprised and not specifically because it was Phelps or that it was LVMH, but um, I, you know, actually wrote a research paper uh, a couple years ago as the last part of becoming an MW, you have to do, uh, uh, write an original work of research. And I, I focused on Napa Valley and part of that was kind of looking at um, what's going to happen over the next decade, couple decades, in terms of sort of larger companies or companies from overseas coming in and and buying up these these properties. And if you kind of look at where everything was headed, it all was pointing to to things like this and more things like this, where there's a lot of these families that um, you know may have small vineyards. I mean, Phelps is not a small winery but you know still kind of founded on the backs of these people who's literally it's it's their name on the bottle but may not have generations to follow that want to take it over the expense becomes too much they get offered a price that they can't resist and um i 
you know, I, I think we'll see more and more of this. And just to have sort of like fair and equal representation here, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It can be a good thing in terms of investment. Maybe they needed some improvements in the winery or the vineyards that maybe they didn't have the capacity to do. So, you know, I think there is sort of this initial sadness always when you hear about these properties, yeah. these family properties being purchased. And in some cases that's warranted, I think, but in some cases, you know, it, it could actually propel that winery and that brand to, you know, new heights. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. To to uh, a, a even stronger position and better wines. Let's say that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think everyone, you're right. We do get a little bit remorseful about the sale of some of these family owned wineries. Of course, I just punned about Heights and, you know, the, right. the Lawrence family has bought Heights and Stony Hill and Burgess and a whole bunch of classic legacy properties. And now LVMH has come in and bought Joseph Phelps. And I think it, it begs the question of like, at what point does Napa Valley really just become a commercial place? But the reality is, most of the wineries are still family owned and operated. It's just the mm -hmm. really big famous ones that are being bought by these big corporations. And to your point, it's incredibly expensive and labor intensive, yes. especially in not only California, but Napa Valley to uphold yes. and maintain the standards of these brands. You know, they, yeah. there's only so much scalability that they can handle as a family owned and operated business. It does require outside investment to some degree to help really break those costs up a little bit. You know, we, I think we've talked about, you know, cost of goods a little bit and, and how that can, uh, and we'll talk about that later when we talk about the ND wines, but I, I do think that there is, you know, there's so much expense involved with growing these brands and sustaining them and can continue because ultimately like we want to be a sustainable place but in order to be a sustainable place you have to stay in business and I think in order to do that you have to have the finances to make that possible so I don't think it's the the negative that we all maybe assume it to be I think it can be a really good thing I also am really excited for Moet Hennessy to have a bigger footprint in Napa Valley I know that's maybe not a popular-ish opinion but I do think that they have done incredible things with all of their all of their brands thus far I'm really excited about the trajectory of Newton in the last few years I think what they've obviously done with these legacy champagne houses is, is brilliant. I'm excited to see what happens with Colgan. So I think there's only good things ahead for Joseph Phelps. The only thing that I was really curious about, because I, I was like, how many cases are they producing? And I, I looked it up and they're producing about 60,000 cases. And mm. we were just talking uh, earlier before we popped on. And I was like, how many cases of that 60,000 do you think are Insignia? Because we think of Insignia as this, you know, it's, it's a very expensive wine, sort of, you know, very allocated, how many cases. And um, I was really surprised by the number and were you surprised I'll share what it is but were you surprised as I, everyone thinks I, about what it might be I was because to your point it's I mean it's it's an expensive wine and and yeah it, it has this sort of air of scarcity about it in some ways so I was quite surprised do you want to reveal what the number was 16,000 cases is what the the number is 16,000 cases of insignia which is not nothing it is not to the degree of something like Dom Perignon which I, I think should be pointed out but it is um it, that's a lot of wine at three hundred plus dollars uh -huh. a bottle. So the reason I say that is because you know a lot of these companies that come in and buy are looking for a little a little meat on the bone, so to speak, right? They want to be able to scale this. They want return on investment, and the only way they can do that is by expanding the brand. And with a brand that's as big as Joseph Phelps already, I am curious to see how they will do that. To which markets they may tap, what wines they might introduce. Uh, they obviously have the Freestone properties out in Sonoma Coast, so I'll be curious to see how they make their return on investment, if at all. If they have to scale, if they have to, you know have more accessible wines if they have to increase the production of insignia. So I think from a financial standpoint, I am curious to see what happens. Should we get into the Let's, the meat and potatoes yeah. of this podcast? All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll give you a moment to think about what we're we're going to talk about. I just want to take a quick second to to remind everyone, if you're loving what we're doing, we really appreciate a like, a subscribe, a review would be amazing. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe to the show. Give us a rating. Leave us a review uh, uh, on whatever podcasting app you choose. Anyone will do. Spotify, iTunes, whatever. Um, and each week we read the reviews of people who leave reviews for us. And uh, today we're gonna re we're gonna read one from the dope legend who said best wine podcast exclamation point ever exclamation point <laughs> I love how Amanda <laughs> and Vanessa can make wine so interesting and relate it to all the guests such great hosts that engage amazing guests to share stories I cannot thank you enough dope legend for that very exclamatory and fun and positive review. We really love hearing that. And we have so much fun doing it. And I'm excited to have our guests back on to bring into some of these really interesting topics that we're going to be focusing on for the second season. So 
Thank you for that. Now we're going to dive in to the NDA wines, what they are, how they came to be. If you're completely lost as to what we're talking about, don't (laughs) worry. We're going to fill you all in. So let's get into the podcast topic, NDA wines. So, I mean, non-disclosure agreement, we're probably used to hearing that legalese in uh, various ways, you know, um, but may, many people may not know that that's also a thing in the wine business as well. So, you know, NDA wines, it can mean a, a couple of different things, the vineyard source, the winemaker, uh, but essentially, and then we'll go, I'm sure, deep into this, Amanda, all the things that, that make up why you might have an NDA wine at all. Um, but essentially, it's a wine where you 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 can get incredible quality from a winery that you may know. It may be a famous brand name or a luxury property, but you're getting at kind of a, a, a much lower price. So it's a way to find incredible value. What you won't know is what all of the sources are. So you may not know when you buy it, who the winemaker is, where it came from, what the source winery was. You certainly can, you can do some research and we can drop some uh, enticing hints when we offer them on wine access that might tell you things like the neighborhood uh, or other places the winemaker has worked, but we can't tell you everything because we do sign an agreement that is, you know, that we stick to, of course, out of respect for relationships and also so we don't end up in court um, to, to respect. <laughs> I do, to, ideal, to respect ideal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ideally not going to jail. That's just what I wake up every day saying. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so that's, and I know, Amanda, you, you've really uh, been such a great source of information for this with what you've done on TikTok. And I think introduced a lot of people to this concept who are now, completely excited about about these types of wines. Yeah, that's been really fun for me. And I, what's been interesting, and I guess not that surprising, is how excited people are for these wines. And just to back up for a second, I just, I want to clarify because I think, you know, we talk about wines being made available at more accessible price points. And there's a few ways in which that this happens, right? You have second labels uh, of wineries mm-hmm. that maybe produce, you know, a second bottling that's more accessible, right? So um, there's right. lots of examples of that in Bordeaux. There's several examples here in Napa. This is very different. This is a, this is a white labeled wine. Uh, and we'll talk about in a second how that comes to be. But these are basically bottlings. And we'll talk about the one that we're drinking right now, which is the Help and Reserve, that become available for a myriad of reasons but to your point they we don't know exactly where the source is we just know that the juice is really great you can give us a few hints and so you're really mm-hmm. getting sort of you're getting Napa Valley wines in this case or wines from wherever at a fraction of the price that are incredibly high quality so you know we use the example for a second label like if you love Mark Jacobs try Mark by Mark Jacobs, right? That's a that's a good way to mm-hmm. do this. But this is more like uh like the Everlane model or something like a soft like a like a software, right? You're going to use software, you're going to white label it, um mm-hmm. and it's going to become yours. It's going to become com- something completely different that you never know, never knew where it existed before. So this is this is really interesting because like I said in the intro, I didn't know that this existed. I always just assumed that as a winery, you either grew grapes and made them into wine and you sold all that wine, or you maybe bought grapes from another estate, again, made the wine and sold all the wine. But there's a lot of instances in which some of that wine can't be used or some of those grapes can't be used. And it's not necessarily because the wine isn't up to snuff. It actually can be for a lot of other reasons. So I do want to talk a little bit about why and how these wines came to be? What are what is the process? As someone like Wine Access, what is the process to sourcing these wines and potentially bottling these wines and selling these wines? What does that look like, and is it the same across the board? Yeah, that's a great question. And and to your point, I think that's a really good distinction that th- these aren't second wines from a property like Bordeaux. I think is what I what I always think of first. You know, like Pavillon Rouge from Chateau Margaux or Le, P- Le Petit Mouton from Chateau Mouton. And as you said, there are plenty of examples here in in Napa Valley as well. But but yeah, you you don't. It's not going to be on the label. Um, I, I'm calling it a source winery, um, meaning what the, you won't see the name of the winery where we purchased this, this wine from. The wine business is very romantic, of course, but it's also, <laughs> it also is a business, you know, and people have a, a business plan. They have sales projections. In some cases, it might start in the vineyard where it's a very productive year. The, the yields are really high. 
Um, and it's just it's just simply too much for the winery to handle in terms of what they've planned for on their P&L, what their salespeople can handle, et cetera. Um, how many barrels and, they have, and, how much space they have in the winery. How much space, that's a great point. Yes, because of course we, we issue orders for our barrels. We have to order them in advance of harvest. And yeah, maybe, wow, I got a lot more wine this year than I expected. And I literally don't have tank space or I don't have barrels for this. Uh, so that can definitely happen in, in some cases. And I remember this, you know, from, from working in wineries and, and realizing this for the first time is there's such extensive um, blending trials that go on. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's not, you don't buy a bottle of wine and it's just the whole vineyard picked at the same time. <laughs> and that all goes into the bottle. You know, there, there are blocks of vineyards that might be kept separate. Um, obviously different varieties could be planted in, in, in the vineyard. And then there's younger vines, there's older vines, there's different types of barrels that they can be put into in the winery. And in some cases, you know, the winemaker well, one of the most important things I would say, maybe the second most after the pick date would, would be this sort of blending where right. they're blending maybe, yeah, like different blocks of vineyards, different varieties, or just different barrels, because even the same barrel, let's say from the same Cooper, like a Terenso, uh, with the same toast level, you might have barrels that, that kind of are, taste a little different. They just be, they have their own personalities. When the winemaker is deciding what is going to go into this bottle, they're trying, sometimes they're doing these percentages down to half a percent of this or a quarter. I mean, it's, it's minutia decisions that they're making. And so sometimes there's great wine that for whatever reason, it just doesn't fit into the overall picture. It's like, oh, I picked, I picked up, I think we were talking about this, Amanda, before we hopped on here about sort of ingredients, if you're cooking and it's like, oh, you know, I, I, I want a little bit of this, a lot of that. And you know what? I bought this, but I'm not going to throw it in this, this particular dinner right. that I'm I mean, making, right? It's like, you know, if you have a, if you have a sauce recipe, right. And it's a tomato based mm-hmm. sauce and you are not using canned tomatoes, you're using fresh tomatoes, maybe use a half a teaspoon normally of oregano, but for what, and, and three t- tablespoons of salt, that's probably a lot of salt. But let's say that the tomatoes come in and the tomatoes are just tasting a little differently than they normally have. And that's that's mm-hmm. normal. Grapes are the same way, right? Grapes are, are not right. going to be the same every single year. And to your point, you have to order these barrels ahead of time. And maybe those barrels traditionally work. But for whatever reason, 2011 vintage, great. Very unusual vintage. And it was a cooler, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more rain. The grapes didn't get quite as ripe. As a result, some of those barrels maybe don't work. And I think that's the case. And and for a lot of these wineries that realize that, hey, the barrels, you know, in in some of these blocks that we ordered them from just aren't working the way that we thought they that mm-hmm. they normally do. We, you know, it's too much salt or it's too much oregano. So I I always love using that sort of sauce example for that. Oh, it's a great example. And then the the benefit is then sometimes there's wine that someone like a wine access can purchase and right. and bottle sign an NDA uh, and bottle under a different label and so you can be drinking vineyard sources you know wines made by winemakers that you would know that you know are household names or revered but we can't we can't put that on the label but we taste all of these wines just like we would any other finished product um, so we're able to to um, taste them, assess them, buy them. Some instances we might do our own blending after as well. And then, and then we bottle them. And so, I, you know, we have one in our glass today that we'll talk about, but, but it's a great way. It's a great way to find some fantastic values, particularly in a place like Napa, which can be very expensive. <laughs> Yeah, because I think the one thing we haven't talked about is the fact that some of these wines are – we're not talking about like nothing sites. Like we're talking about very prestigious vineyards, wineries Mm -hmm. that some of these – some of these bottlings are coming from, you know, wines that I've seen listed on the description as like $300 plus that you're getting Mm -hmm. for $35. So we're not talking about, you know, a hundred bucks off. We're talking about a literal tenth of the price of what these – normal wines would be. And I think that's very appealing for a lot of people who are just trying to understand what Napa Cab is about. Or what I also love, and I have a ton of collector friends and clients who do this, they they sort of use them as their, um, as the wines that they, their protector wines, right? The wines that, you know, maybe they've <laughs> had three great bottles of Colt Napa Cab and it's 1230 and they're like, I don't want to open another $1,000 bottle. And so they open something like this and they're like, 
this is great. This totally works. So it's, you know, it's these seller defenders is the, the, the category that I refer the, to them as these seller defenders where like you can buy a case and it's not, you know, it's for, I never like to use price as a relative, but like, you know, for 300 bucks, you can usually get a case of these wines and you can have them mm-hmm. as seller defenders. You can use them for parties, whatever. And they're amazing. And they give you a little taste of what Napa is all about, which is pretty cool because in that price bracket, there's not a lot out there that gives you that quality of wine at that price. Right. Seller defender. I like that. I call them yeah. safety wines. <laughs> safety wines is cute too. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're right. It's always that last bottle and then you're feeling really generous also. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, let's open that the bottle that I've been holding for 15 years, you know, but yeah. So let's do yeah. it. And then your next morning, let's... you're like, I don't really remember what that tasted like because that was the, <laughs> the last, <laughs> like, the exactly. last bottle of the evening. <laughs> exactly. And I should say, like, it's not to say that these wines have to be the last bottle of the evening. I know plenty of yeah. people who actually do full lineups with, you know, the and what I love is, you know, you guys put out these descriptions and we're going to talk about that in just a second. These descriptions that give you these little hints that you can kind of take and do your own sleuthing to try to figure out what the mm-hmm. source site is. And I, I know there's like a whole Reddit sub community around this and like shout out to these guys and gals who are on the Reddit sub community, just trying to like sleuth their way through what these NDA wines are. But I love seeing some of these lineups where they're like, well, it said it was from like the Western foothills of Oakville. So they get every bottling from that area and then they put it up against like these these NDA wines and they they try to like sleuth it out. And oftentimes these wines perform really, really well in the lineup. Like I've seen plenty of Instagram story posts and Instagram posts that are like this wine outperformed X, Y, and Z wines. And it's pretty impressive that like, you know, Robert Parker always said there are no great wines. There are only great bottles of wine. So I just want to point out that like you never know when a $30 bottle of wine is going to outperform your $300 bottle of wine. And I think this is these wines are definitely uh, capable of doing that. Okay, so this is super interesting. So we've got the Halpin Reserve in our glass. And I should mention mm-hmm. we've got – a wine club associated with this podcast uh, now. I know no. how exactly. <laughs> I know. It's yeah, if so you exciting. missed if you did, missed the first episode where we talked about the wine club, the wine club is going to be four bottles. One of those bottles is going to be from an episode, and then we're also going to make the wines available via our. Sorry, the other. So we we normally have two wines. We're actually only drinking one in this episode, but we normally have two wines. The second wine will be available via our SMS messaging service. So if you want to sign up for that, you can do that. We'll do so. We'll have a link in the description in the show notes um, where you can sign up. So on that note, I want to mention that even though we're, we're talking about the help and reserve, if you sign up for the text messages, you will be notified when our favorite new NDA wines come to light. Because the other thing we haven't talked about is these guys sell out real fast. They like do. I mentioned, th- and this is not a scare tactic, like legitimately they yeah. sell out. Um, and the Reddit sub community can, can sort of attest to this. So there's only so much of this juice to go around and it gets bottled. And then like, once it's gone, it's gone. And, you know, I may have lent a hand in selling out a few of these wines in the past. And for that, I apologize in no way. Um, but I will say that, you know, like <laughs> they, they have been known to disappear in 24 hours. Like legitimately I have seen, mm-hmm. I have seen NDA wines like appear at 12 p.m. Pacific Coast time and be gone by 9 a.m. the following day. Like it's no problem. Um, Like when people buy these, they buy cases of them and then that's that. Uh, So there it is. It is worthwhile to get on a a messaging service or even just sign up for wine wine access to be notified of when these wines are made available. But we've got the the Halpin Reserve and we've got We've got a few little hints. Do you want to talk about some of these hints, Vanessa? So what I can tell you is um, this vineyard has been a source for places like Araujo, Cakebread, Lale, Mandavi, and more. Would you like to give a hint? I think one of the big hints is that not only (laughs) is it from Oakville, uh, you guys are saying that it is from vineyards situated where the valley floor meets the Mayakamas Mountains. So that's a p- pretty narrow window of vineyards that exist there. Like we're talking mm-hmm. about the western benches of of Oakville. Not a big place, but all prized terroir, right? Like 
you you scan up and down that ABA on the western side and you're like not a bad vineyard to be found. So I think that's a pretty big hint. Mm -hmm. The other one, you know, and I love some of these quotes that you'll include sometimes um, from from the, you know, whether it's from a critic or whoever, a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, Venice founder Antonio Galoni, former Wine Access Unfiltered podcast guest. Check that. That's a great episode. I like that episode a lot. Praised their own wine estate, which they began releasing in recent years and goes for 200. That's a that's a that's a hint. Began releasing in recent years and goes for 200 plus dollars as, quote, one of the benchmark Cabernets in Napa Valley today. So there's a there's a lot of really good hints in here. So I think the sleuthing will. But I have to say, aside from the hints, like the juice in this glass is ridiculous. First of all, I'm looking at the color. It's so concentrated and beautiful and lovely, but it's it great. does have that perfectly western oakville like graphite intensity but like really lush fruit you know if i think about eastern and western oakville eastern you know over on like you know we're like red screen eagle doll valley like very like red fruited side of things and very um always has this like terracotta thing going on like very red soils um you know definitely like leans into the mineral side the western side of oakville for me is always you know to me it was like the vegas showgirl right like it's it's all legs it's very flashy but it's very intense very talented very gorgeous fruit um and i think this wine definitely definitely speaks to sight which is western oakville i've been to this to this, uh, the source winery, uh, to this vineyard. And I can attest that the level of farming, um, is outstanding. I mean, what they're, the investment that they've put into these, these vineyards are you know, it's top notch. And I think you can tell in the glass. I do too. It's a beautiful wine. I, it's going to be somewhere between 30 and $40. If you, if you're not part of the club, this wine will be available. Um, and we'll let you know, but you know, obviously you're guaranteed to get this wine in the club. And if you like it, you know, obviously buy more if it's still available. Um, this, I don't know, this to me is like, it's a wine that's shockingly ready. This is a, this is a 2020 vintage. Um, it's shockingly approachable, which I get, it's not that surprising given the fact that it was a, it was a warm vintage. Um, it did have some, you know, some complications, but, uh, I don't think any of those things show in the glass at all. Like this is, this is a beautiful, perfect, uncompromised wine, so to speak, because, you know, we're talking about 2020. There's going to be a lot of questions around smoke, taint, and fires. Um, and it really is going to be a case by case basis, right? Like not every, a lot of, a lot more people than I had expected are releasing wines out of the 2020 vintage. I think everyone assumed it was going to be a wash and that's not necessarily the case. There is some really, really beautiful wine. So I do just want to mention the fact that the, despite it's a 2020 vintage, absolutely nothing. Sorry, I got a glass close to my mic because I can't help myself. Absolutely nothing that I'm smelling <laughs> in the way of like smoke taint right now. It, it smells delicious. It tastes beautiful. So I, I think that's worth noting. And you guys taste all these wines to make sure of that. I, well, yes. And something I, I, I exactly wanted to point out was just that we, we do taste them, but also, um, you know, we do have laboratory analysis run as well. So. Oh, that's good to know. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so you're sending these wines out to ETS and getting, is it glycol levels that you're testing for? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Have you run into situations where you send it out to ETS where it's come back as positive yet or no? I actually haven't. And none of the wines that have been submitted to us, we've, we've had that issue. I've definitely tasted some that aren't um, uh, NDA wines that we're tasting that have been submitted that are finished wines oh. that I have some questions about. Okay. Um, but, but, uh, but no, um, we have not, we have not run into that. Cause you know, the winery will do its own testing first as well, but then of course we will confirm. Interesting. Man, this this 2020 vintage is going to be so so fascinating to work with. I know some wineries are releasing, some wineries are not. Some wineries are holding back to see what happens. Um, there's so mm -hmm. much that we don't know about smoke taint, but what I will say is like, you know, these wines are. It was 2020 was a great vintage, which like makes what happened suck, right? Like it sucks that we <laughs> yeah. had all these it was other a great vintage yeah, it was a great vintage it um it was you know it was beautiful it was warm it was you know sunny until it wasn't there are a few questions that we have from the audience uh oh, yes. okay. around nda wines are nda wines mainly just cabernet based oh not at all it could be anything it could be it could be any any variety um white red rosé 
sparkling even. So no, it, it we happen to be drinking Cabernet today, but it could be mm-hmm. it could be any type of wine. Yeah, one of my favorites was the Star Treatment Rosé. <laughs> I loved that wine that was available last year. I don't think it's available now. Another question that I think is a really good question. Can I buy NDA wines directly from wineries or are they mainly sold via retailers like Wine Access? That's a great question. That is a great question. And the answer is really no, you can't buy them from the wineries. They, uh, we purchase the the wines or in some cases, the grapes even from the wineries. And then it, it becomes ours to sell at that point. And I think that's what makes these so special, right? Like you can't get them from the winery. Like they they don't they don't exist and you you know i i'm a very big fan of these wines and i love that wine access makes them available because i think it speaks to what you guys do as a company in general and it really is one of the great values that you guys have on on the site does wine access create their own exclusive nda wines with winemakers um so we have collaborations that we've done um with with winemakers uh that we disclose the winemaker we we have um sort of partnered on one where called nom de plume that mm. uh i literally like in a parking lot before i could walk into the vineyard had to like sign an nda like leaning on my trunk um <laughs> That yes, we partnered with a famous winemaker um, in uh, from a vineyard site in, in Oakville, and sort of became the exclusive uh, opportunity to buy this wine. The next question is, I guess, for me, so I'll ask myself: uh, <laughs> As a former sommelier, would you would you ever have NDA wines on your list and serve them to cu- to customers? So this sort of like goes back to the question before about where to buy these wines. So we're talking about we we use the term NDA wine, but white label wine, private label wines. These all do exist in the wine world, and there are plenty of restaurants. Like I think Del Frisco's has some, Landry's does them. A lot of your bigger restaurants will work directly with wineries to create private labels where the vineyard source is not necessarily disclosed. So there there are examples of that outside of wine access. Mm-hmm. I have never personally done it. I think being a SOM in Napa Valley, there was never really a reason to because we we got access to such great things but I wouldn't be opposed to it and I think that if the opportunity came came about for you know if there are psalms listening to this podcast I don't think there's anything wrong with it I think in fact I think it's a great way to offer incredible cabernets pinots whatever to your guests especially for by the glass purposes because whether we like to you know talk about it or not you know, napa valley cab is incredibly expensive and you want to mm-hmm. if you want to offer one of quality on your list at a by the glass price that's tough to do you know less than less than 20 25 bucks like especially now that's really tough to do so it's a great yeah, way to is. go about it it's just you know the problem is um, a lot of these private labels, like, you know, the ones that Del Frisco's and like Landry's are doing, you know, you have to be buying at volume at scale. And so not every place has the ability to do that. That said, there are, I, I do believe there are other private label wines that are made available through distribution. The only issue with that is like, obviously you have to taste. And, and what I love about what you guys are doing here is like, I know that you personally, Vanessa, along with your team are tasting mm-hmm. these wines. You're sending them yeah. out to ETS. You have direct relationships with the winemakers. You know these vineyard sources. You know the conditions because everyone lives here. So there is sort of, to me, it's the best way. And I'm not saying this because I host the podcast. Like it is the best way to get NDA wines. And I I have yet to encounter a better source for them and better pricing. So yeah, drink to that. <laughs> she's like, she's like, I That's know. I, I, was like, I know we're good. So <laughs> no, the wine is good. It's really good. Age worthiness. Um, I know you guys often put the drink dates. What would you say age worthiness of these wines are? You know, we do, we taste everything. I think this I'd put like 2031 to 32, something like that. So yeah, we do in our tasting notes, we always include our recommended drinking window. However, I will say that that is, that is up to the drinker to decide yes. because some people really love young wines. Some people really love mature wines. We're giving you a window of time where we think the wine will be showing at its best, but uh, within that uh, or beyond that, you have at it, whatever it's your money you know, and your palate. So you drink it when you want. Yeah, no, I think we've talked about that in a few of us as before, you know, this idea of drinking window is a really tough one. I get this question a lot. When should I drink these wines? And not just the NDA wines, I think wines in general, like when is the best time? The reality is that it really is 
a very personal choice. And Mm -hmm. wines that are young, especially Cabernet from Napa, they tend to be, you know, in their their primary fruit, their baby fat stages. So they can be really young, kind of plushy fruit. I think this definitely has plushy fruit, but it still has really great backbone and structure. Um, For me personally, this wine is a wine that's drinking great now, but I'd be pumped to have this in 10 years. So you know, we're just going to be diving more into those graphite minerally, you know, those secondary yeah. tertiary flavors that are more earth driven than fruit driven. So if you're not into earthy yeah. wines, drink them young. That's all. Yeah. And I'm, I'm definitely a, a fan of Napa Cabernet with some years on them. So yes, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> we have to share a good bottle of, well, we should do an old Napa Cab episode at some point. Cause I would love that. That would be fun. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I've been, I've been like, you know, keeping some of my cellar just like ready to go. So maybe you and I can like curl up with a nice bottle and maybe we can, maybe you can do some sleuthing on who's got some wine available, back vintage that we can make available to, um, oh, I'm making ideas. a lot of promises right now. I know. And I'm just saying yes to everything. <laughs> yes. Sorry, AJ. Sorry, Joe. Um, also shout out to Andrew Wallach who, uh, does a lot of the sleuthing for these wines on the back end mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Um, he does a great job with that. Uh, I think that's it for our questions. Is there anything that you want to add in terms of things we haven't talked about around NDA wines? I think just, um, I think we've covered most of it, but, but just that, you know, if you haven't tried one, um, you know, give it a shot, see what you think. I think in most instances, people are really, um, excited and surprised to find the quality in the bottle. And certainly I'm excited that we're including uh, the Halpin Reserve in our club shipment. Yes, I'm excited too. And just a reminder, you know, once again, I always like to speak on my Nexus's behalf. Uh, if you don't like the bottle that you receive, if it's not up to snuff, um, Wine Access guarantees all their wine and they'll credit you back your hard earned yeah. money to find something else that you'll love because That's you right. guys are the best. Satisfaction, right. Satisfaction guarantee. Yep. Obviously, if you liked this episode, once again, please like it, leave a review, subscribe to this podcast, and uh, come back and entertain with us uh, whenever you'd like and drink some wine. The Wine Club is available, and we, like I said, we'll have all the links in the descriptions. Um, This has been such a fun show. I'm really glad that we got to dive in. But if you have more questions, I encourage you to reach out to us on the Wine Access Unfiltered Instagram. Tweet us your questions on uh, the Wine Access Unfiltered Twitter account, or you can just DM Vanessa and or myself um, personally, and we can respond to your questions there. We love hearing from you guys. If you've got questions or ideas for future episodes as well, I encourage you to leave them um, in any of our mailboxes that you see fit. This has been a ton of fun, and I look forward to seeing you next week. This episode has been produced by Chappie Cottrell, who's been making sure that we stay on track, and we appreciate you so much. And we are your hosts, Vanessa Conlin and Amanda McCrossin. We'll see you next time. Until then, cheers. Spanish surfing gypsy girl.